I want to talk to you about healing. Every one of you probably in your lifetime will need some form of healing. Healing of the heart, healing of memories, healing of the broken heart. Healing of your body. Maybe you've got a broken spirit. Dries the bones. And so the Lord has provided healing for us. It's part of our covenant. It's part of the redemptive work of Christ. But what's so interesting about healing is it's counterintuitive. That means it's, it, it's counter to intuition. It's opposite of intuition. You would think that you go before God and say, God, I need to be healed. I've got a pain or I've got this or that. And God would say, okay, I will heal you. And God does say, I will heal you. That's the way we would think it would happen and then right then we would be healed. But it's not a common sense application of healing. It's biblical. It's a biblical. It's counterintuitive. Because what really happens is we have something go wrong with our bodies and we go to God or our spirits, our souls, our hearts, our minds, and we say, God, heal me. And here's what God says. I already did at the cross. Jesus would say to each one of us, I already healed you at the cross. Now, since Jesus bore our infirmities and carried away our sickness and our diseases, he's already taken all of our infirmities that could ever possibly happen to us, and he bore them away on the cross. What is our response then when we ask God to heal us? It's, thank you, God, I have it now. It's mine, I have it now. And then when God, when you come before God and ask him to heal you, you might not feel a thing. Not one thing. But you have to take it as a fact. You just don't take it by faith. It's a fact of Calvary that Jesus already bore it away. So if Jesus bore away our infirmities and our sickness and diseases, then what is our response what should our response be? I want you to go to Mark 11. This verse is so key to everything that we will ever receive by faith. Mark 11, 24. If you can't wrap your mind around Mark eleven twenty four, you really won't be un able to understand Bible faith. You won't be able to understand the principles of the word of God because everything was already done for us at the cross. Jesus bore it all. Sin, sickness, disease. Everything we would ever face in life, he already bore it. And then he went to hell and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the devil. Now, if that weren't enough, Matthew 28, he stood before his disciples, were his disciples, and he said, all power and all authority has been given unto me. Now go ye. And that's when he gave the keys of authority to the church. Right at that moment, we have the keys of authority now. So now we have something to say about our healing not just God. We have something to say. One of the most, one of the major tenets of faith is you can have whatsoever you say. People will get in a furor about that. People, there's small wars being fought worldwide in Christianity because someone said you can have what you say. But who was that someone? Well, let's read Mark 11. 22, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. Well, what is the God kind of faith? The God kind of faith is the faith that says it before you see it. 
The God kind of faith is a faith that creates out of nothingness, says light be, and there's light. He created all the universe, Genesis chapter 1. You need to read through Genesis chapter 1 and underline all the scriptures that said, he said, he said, he said, and it was. And then God looked upon it and said it was good. Now that's Bible faith. We can't get away from Bible faith. You have to say it, proclaim it, declare it, decree it before you will ever see it. Being human, we want to see it first and then declare it. I like seeing it first and then declaring it. But guess what? I don't get to have my way about Bible faith. Neither do you. We have to follow the biblical principles in God's word. So many people fight against bi biblical principles. They're not going to win. God is bigger than we are. So let's back up and look at verse 23. You're not going to go very far in life if you don't acknowledge, accept, and understand Mark eleven twenty three. 23. You know, people say, well, people, this is name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. But who said you can have what you say? Only Jesus. It was Jesus. The devil never said it. Jesus said it. So we need to take another look at Mark eleven twenty three 23 and understand it's a principle that is working in the world and in the universe because God established the universe and he did it all by saying first. He said it and it was. So why would we get in a uh, argument with God since he set the rules and the principles of faith. Why would anybody want to do that? That would be counterproductive. So look at verse 23. For assuredly, in other words, Jesus is saying, I swear to you, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatsoever he says now let me just say we're not off in the wild blue yonder on saying and confession we say what God says we say God's word we're not making things up I'm going to be the next president of the United States no, that's ludicrous. We are saying the principles of God's word. We're saying scriptures. That's what we're decreeing. We're not decreeing something out in the blue. Something that's nonsensical. We are quoting God's word, bringing his word to bear. As, as God said to us long ago, wring everything you can out of my covenant that I've given you. Ring everything you can out of every scripture that promises you something that I've already given you. I remember a friend of ours who was pastor here in this city and somebody said, asked him the question, are you teaching your people about some, you know, highfalutin thing, end times? And this is what the pastor said, I'm just trying to get him to read the Bible, to read their Bibles. And that's so true, because everything's in the Word. Here's what you find. People who don't read the Bible, they get off. They always put the Spirit of God first, trying to be led by the Spirit. But the Spirit of God bears witness to the truth of the Word of God. You can't be all Spirit-led and no Logos, no Word, no Rhema Word-led. You have to be Word first, and then spirit. Now you'd think everybody would know this. But they don't. And so they come along and it's all spirit. It's all what they pick up in the spirit. The only problem with that is there's many voices in the world. None of them is without signification. 
What voices are you listening to? That's what matters. That's why you have to stay grounded by being in the word first. If it breaks the word, then it's not God. For example, you hear from the spirit, oh, I'm gonna marry so, so and so. Let's say a person named Anne. I'm gonna marry Anne. Well, they heard it by the spirit. What spirit did they hear it by? Because the problem is Anne is already married. Big problem. God never violates his word. God is not a rebel. Holy Spirit penned the word of God. The, the, God does not commit adultery with his people. He doesn't tell you to go marry this one or that one, but, oh, wait a minute, hey, there's a little problem. They're already married. Now, that means the person is being spirit-led, but we just don't know what spirit it is, but we know it's not the spirit of God because the spirit of God penned the Bible. And so when we read God's word, we're not to commit adultery, fornication. So we would know right off the bat that that is, uh-oh, that's a wrong spirit. Do yourself a favor. Read the Bible a lot. Understand what it says. So Jesus is saying the God kind of faith has to decree and declare God's word because that's the only solid thing in the universe. Everything else is going to pass away. So I want to read to you, it, it, it's an article that I discovered that's very, very helpful. It's called The Three Tenses of Healing and it's by, written by Fanny Rowe. If we don't get on God's agenda, Jesus was telling us in Mark eleven twenty three. it will take three times as much proclaiming and declaring and saying as it will be believing in your heart. You can believe in your heart that something is going to happen because God's told you. But you may have doubt in your head. That just means you need to get your mind renewed with the word of God, with the promises of God. Most of the time, if we could ever measure this, I would say that most of us walk around with unrenewed minds. Maybe a fourth renewed. But we walk around without our minds renewed. The other thing, here's another thing I heard. You know, you hear things from people and you think, doesn't anybody read the Bible and see the principles in God's word? Here's another one I heard. Well, God had me live with a man for many years. Well, that's sin, right? That's sin. Would everybody agree that's sin? God had me live with a man for many years so that I would be in place to marry him when the time was right. So I said to that woman, first it broke my heart, I just about thought I'd pass out that anyone would believe such a lie. We have to get the lies out of us. And you do it by reading God's word. There's so many lies out there. When she said that to me, it was like a stab in the heart. And I said to her, so you're telling me that Jesus Christ made you sin by living with a man out of, outside of marriage so that you would be ready for the moment he, was, he wanted to get you married to that man. Is that what you're saying? And she fumbled around. She looked at her friend and she couldn't really answer that because that is in fact what she was saying. Jesus had her walk in sin for many years, be in sin, that means she was in darkness. She was violating God's word. Here's the problem. God's word is Jesus Christ. Go to John 14. People have to get their thinking straight. If you don't have your thinking straight, your behavior won't be straight. If you don't have your thinking straight, your spirit won't be straight. Your speech won't be straight. 
Everything will be crooked. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is God. We don't have to wonder about, well, this is just a little fairy tale. No, the Word is God. Everything God said has been burnished and burned, Psalm 12, 6, seven times to make it pure. Seven times, think about it. So we can't just come up with our own doctrine. In the beginning was the Word, John 1. And the Word was God, and the, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was was the light of men. His life is our light. But if we don't walk in the light, if we walk in darkness, by not getting our lives founded on the principles in God's word, then we're going to walk in darkness for our whole time, our whole life. We could. That could be possible. Now, perhaps, let me just clear up another issue. Some people say, well, I'm called to be an apostle. I'm called to be a prophet teacher, evangelist, pastor, whatever. That may well be, but I want to tell you something. There's quite a road to get to that. There's quite a road. God tests you. He tries you. Say you're called to be an apostle. Say you know in your spirit you're called to be an apostle. And there are apostles. Let's go to Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. All those Old Testament saints that were in the belly of the earth, in Abraham's bosom or paradise, there was a big compartment called Sheol. Sheol. The half, one half of the, apartment, of the compartment was Hades, or hell. That's where the departed wicked spirits went. Ahab, Jezebel, they went to Hades, to hell. But in the other part of the compartment, remember there's a chasm fixed. Between these two is Abraham's bosom, is paradise. And that's where the righteous dead went. And it was paradise. They weren't suffering. But those who were wicked, they were in Hades or hell, they were suffering. So when Jesus left captivity captive, he led all those saints, all those men of covenant, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Hannah, all the people, godly people, he led them to heaven. And then he gave gifts to men. What are those gifts? Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Fivefold ministry offices. Well, maybe you're not in the fivefold. Where do you fit? Go to 1 Corinthians. Twelve. Verse 28. Well, let's pick it up in 27. Now you are the body of Christ and men members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles. Doesn't mean they're the highest and the best. This is a list. This is what Jesus explained to Brother Hagen. Doesn't mean that apostles are preeminent. Apostles start, start works. So if you say you're an apostle, how many works have you started? How many churches have you built? What have you done that's apostolic in nature? An apostle starts something from nothing. 
First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administration, variety of tongues. So this is also a list of the fivefold ministry office. Let's break it down and look at it. First apostles, those are people who start works. Maybe they start a church. Maybe they go to India and they start orphanages. They start something for the Lord that gives glory to the Lord, not to themselves. Then there are prophets. Prophets speak forth the will of God. Third, teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healings. Well, that's the office of the evangelist. When Peter went to Samaria in Acts chapter 8, there were healings. There were wonders that happened because, excuse me, Philip was the evangelist. And so there were healings. There were gifts of healings. There were miracles. Helps ministry. What's that? Notice the helps ministry is sandwiched in between the ministry offices. Because the helps ministry is the body of Christ at large who go to church. Maybe they are called to the apostolic office someday. God doesn't set you in these offices necessarily immediately. That office of the apostle, if you are called to the office of the apostle, I'm not going to say you aren't. If God called you, I believe you. Here's the point. You're going to be broken and broken and broken and broken. In fact, you will be so broken by God. You'll be so broken by God because God is not going to entrust anybody to the office of the apostle who just says, I'm an apostle. And they haven't done one thing for God. I get such a kick out of it because I remember years ago we were in a certain building and it was a nice building. It was a wonderful conference room. We had to set up and tear down all the time, but still, it was a wonderful place. So I was ministering, and in the back walked two men, and they sit down in the back. And they're chatting amongst themselves, which is just rude. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to the pastor, then the Holy Spirit is not having a chat in the back. And so they were talking amongst themselves, and we went back to talk to them after service, and they said, they were probably in their 20s. They were punks. Sorry, excuse me, but they were. They were punks. As Brother Hagin used to say, punks are, is rotten wood. And so we went back to talk to them, and they said, we're the apostles over this church. Oh, did you start this church? As a matter of fact, you didn't start this church. As a matter of fact, Pastor Stephanie and I started this church in our living room with eight people. And it grew so fast that we had to, in three months, we had to leave and start going to different buildings. So no, did you start this church? Well, no, but God said, the Holy Spirit said, that we're the apostle over this church. And I said, you know what? That's not even scriptural. Now, you may be called to the apostolic, apostolic office, but if you are, God will break you and mold you and make you and break you and break you and break you until you're so submissive to the word of God first and the spirit of God second that if God, if Jesus even breathes or whispers something in your ear, you pick up on it and you obey it and you can trace it to a principle, to scripture, in the Bible. I, I, I really wanted to just guffaw and laugh. It was so ludicrous. So we were, uh, we had a, a dear friend at that time and we talked to him about it. So they started showing up in our services and sitting in the back and doing, uh, leveling all kinds of whatever, criticism. Who knows how they were hurting the service in the spirit because they were out of order. They were out of order. So we told this friend of ours, they needed a father, a spiritual father. We told him about them and we said, would you please go talk to these two young men? They may have an apostolic call, but it's not for this moment because they haven't been through the Lord's crucible yet. Now, I don't know if you know about the Lord's crucible, 
Can I tell you about the Lord's crucible? It hurts like blazes. It's not fun. It's not happy. And it crucifies self. And it crucifies ego. And it's painful because you realize you're nothing without Jesus Christ. You're nothing without the Holy Ghost and God the Father. You're nothing without the Bible. It's God's crucible. He'll put you in situations that are so hard, there's no way you can do those situations. You can't figure them out. You don't know what to do. You don't have the power. So guess where you live? You live on your face before God, crying out to him. How do I solve this? What do I do? This is more. This is bigger than I am. I can't do life by myself. You have to get involved. And so you know what God says when you say those words to him? He says, draw nigh unto me. Get closer to me. Become one with me. And let me solve these things for you, through you, to you, with you. When sheep, little sheep, wander from the shepherd, they're the ones that are eaten by the lions. You can't wander away from Jesus. You've got to stick close to him. God will deliberately, if you are called to the fivefold, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or even minister of helps. I'm telling you, the helps ministry. A church cannot do church with those, without those in the helps ministry. And if people in the helps ministry are unfaithful, then it weakens the church. If they're disloyal, it weakens the church. God will crucify people in the helps ministry just like he does anybody else because they're the bulwark that hold up the pastors of the church by prayer, by intercession, by doing things we can't do, the, the cleaning of the church. All the things that are required to run a church, they do that. They're indispensable. But usually they're not people. Ours, our ministry of helps, they're wonderful. They don't go around, you know, with stuffed shirt like, look what I do, this is what I do. Not like years ago when we had a woman who wanted to be seen. So she insisted on carrying my purse and my valise up to the front row. I'm capable of carrying my own purse and valise up to the front row, but she was so insistent, so I let her, thought, well, she can be a minister of helps and help me. But her motive was wrong. All she wanted was to be seen. That's all she cared about. Look, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you want to be seen, you're in the wrong business because God will crush that in you. He'll crush it. If you're in the ministry for the wrong motives, any kind of wrong motives. If you're in the ministry for money, you might as well forget it. God will crush you. He'll crush that out of you so fast. He'll put you to shame. If you're in the ministry for pride, arrogance, to be seen, I'm telling you, the pulpit may look like it's uh, glamorous. It is not glamorous because you get crucified before you ever get to the pulpit. Over and over and over again, you're crucified. It's not a life that I would ask for. But on the other hand, it's a wonderful life because you have these encounters with God that most people don't even dream of. But they could have them too if they would just relinquish their will and press into the word of God and press into the spirit of God and go after Jesus. Go after Jesus. You're not going after man. You're not going after money. You're not going after ambition. You're just going after the Lord Jesus Christ to apprehend him, to be consumed with fire like he was. This is the reality of the ministry. So when someone comes along to, to me and says, I'm an apostle, I am his present tense, I would say it this way, I'm called eventually, I have the seeds of the apostolic in me. And I'm on my way, but in the meantime, God's crucifying me. 
Jesus Christ is just crucifying me all the time. I'm in the fire. Well, the fire is one of the best places to be in. Look, when Moses saw the burning bush, the bush never burned, never burned away. It kept burning in fire. That's what we're supposed to be. I've said this before, bears repeating. I don't like this sentence, but I think it's really true. When God wants to use somebody, he kills them first. He'll kill you. Now, you've got to get this in balance because the devil will kill you too. He'll kill you physically. I'm talking about there's death of a vision. You had a big vision when you first got saved. Oh, this is how life is going to be. This is what's going to happen. And this is not a downer message. It's a message of realism. And then as you go along, you will suffer death of a vision. But there's always resurrection. Death of a vision, resurrection. Until God gets us so malleable, just like putty in his hands, when he says to us, stop that, we stop. When he says to us, I want you to go do this, we do it. Because you get so intimately connected to his voice on the inside of you. You know that voice. You know his voice. How do you know the voice? Because you know the voice of the one who wrote this Bible. And your head is always, your eyes are always feasting on scripture. I can't sit down to pray without a Bible. I just can't do it. You're so in the Bible, in the word, meditating on who God is and what he's done for you. So that when you hear his voice in your spirit, you know that you know that you know that that's his voice. So when we know that we're called to a certain office, a high office like apostolic or prophetic, I knew the first week, in fact, the first day I was born, uh, filled with the spirit, I knew I was called to the office of the prophet. But it took a lot of time for God to break and break and break. That's what he does to all of us. Those breakings seem harsh and hard. They're wonderful. The breakings of God are wonderful. Best thing that could ever happen to you and I is to be broken from our strong, stubborn will. I'm going to do this. If you have that attitude, look, God, I'm determined I'm going to do this. Just know you're in for breakings. He'll break you. If you're not following his voice and following his word first, he will break you. Didn't plan on saying all of that, but it's true. Go back to Mark eleven twenty three. 23. And while I'm at it, let me just say, we are all in this growth process together. Nobody has arrived. And this is why we need so much love and comfort from one another. Do you realize that? Because somebody could be hurting. I just picked up in my spirit a couple of days ago, somebody was really, really hurting. Now you can ignore that when that comes or you can reach out to them and say, somehow I've got to help the hurting person. When we get these, in our spirits, people coming into our hearts over and over, do something about it. Call them. See if there's any way you can encourage them or help them. It's the Holy Spirit saying, they're going through a breaking. They're being burned by my fire, burning off all the dross, all the things that don't belong there. Self-will is a big thing. Reach out to that person. Help that person. Because that means if you sow into that person's life when they're hurting, somebody's going to sow into your life when you're hurting. I cannot estimate, God can, how important it is that we say the right thing. 
When we want healing, it seems like we would just ask God for healing. And, and we can, we can ask God for healing. But you have to go back to Isaiah 53. I want us to turn there. It's a harsh reality in one sense of the word, and yet it's a glad tiding in another sense that Jesus already healed us at the cross. It's a harsh reality because your senses will scream, I am not healed. I am in pain. Your senses will scream that to you all the time. But look at Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs, our sickness, our pain. He already bore it. And carried away our sorrows, our pain. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And he was. He was. Before time began, the mighty three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, discussed how they would handle the fall of man. That didn't take God by surprise. God knew that man would fall. They discussed how they would redeem man, and they knew all the power is in the blood. All the life is in the blood. Leviticus 14. So they knew they had to have a sacrificial lamb. Jesus knew it. He lived with it. All those myriad of thousands, decades, how many millennia of years before he even came to earth. And then he knew it all the days of his life as he walked on this earth that he had to be the sacrificial lamb. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgression. This is why when you ask God forgiveness, let it go. Because Jesus was wounded for your transgression, my transgression. Don't belabor it. My mother used to say to us when we were young Christians, Never stay. It's a sin to stay in guilt and condemnation. And some people will stay in guilt and condemnation like they have to continually beat themselves to make up, to punish themselves for their error. Jesus already did that. He already bore our punishment. If you try to carry your own guilt and shame, all you will do is prolong your time of being bound. You don't have to carry guilt and shame. Jesus already did it. So knock it off. Don't do that to yourself. Get over it. Realizing that you put him to an open shame if you say he hasn't done enough. He has done enough. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes, we're already healed. Now go over to First Peter 2.24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Notice, this is past tense. We already were healed. So here's what I've had to come to in this healing dilemma, shall we say. You're either going to believe your senses or you're going to believe the word of God. You're either going to believe your pain or you're going to believe that Jesus Christ carried your sickness and disease. And really, when it comes down to it, we're either calling Jesus a liar, Jesus, you didn't really bear it, because look, I'm still in pain. Now, what I have come to is the fact that Jesus always tells the truth. If he bore it, we're already healed right now. So if you and I are healed, what would we do if we're healed? What course of action would we take if we're healed? Well, look at Proverbs 12, verse 14. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. 
By the fruit of his mouth, by what he says, we will be satisfied. And the recompense of a man's hands will be re rendered to him. The tongue of the wise promotes health. So if a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, then our mouth has to, we have to make it work for us. Look at Proverbs 18.20. A man's stomach shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. A man's stomach, a man's inner being will be satisfied by what comes out of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Why? Why? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. I have a friend, dear friend, wonderful man. He has been singing the same song for 20 years. He has prayer petitions out there. I want you to hear this. Wonderful man. Uh, gifted, very gifted, very astute. Nice person. But he's been singing the same song for 20 years. Jesus, this is what I want from you. X, Y, Z. But his next breath is, why haven't you ever given me X, Y, Z? In other words, he believes for his dreams and then with his own mouth, he tears down the fact that Jesus didn't give it to him. The minute we ask, Jesus, ans God answers our prayers. If we would just learn to receive most people are askers, and you need to be a world-class ask, asker and ask for big, huge things. Salvation of, that we can fill stadiums full of people and get them all saved. You need to be a giant, a world-class asker. But some place or another, you're going to have to be a world-class receiver and receive that he heard you the minute he heard you, he answered right then. Every prayer is answered immediately. How do I know that? Keep your place there and let's go back to Mark eleven twenty four. Mark eleven twenty four. I'm going to pick it up in 23, just to make the point. For assuredly, I swear to you, Jesus said, I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. He could doubt in his mind though, that's okay. But believes that those things he says will be done, he shall have whatever he says. So now it's more incumbent upon us whether we ever receive our answer by what we say next. By what we start saying. Therefore I say to you, what things soever you ask when you pray, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So I use the analogy because this is how God showed me. You ask. Let's say you're asking to God, his throne. The minute you ask, the answer is released. But if you keep asking in doubt and unbelief, that answer can't get to you. God, I ask you for a new car. God, where's my new car? God, you didn't give me a new car. Now, the answer, he's already released the answer, but I have to receive the answer. If I don't receive it, I'm not going to get it. Even though God answered that, I will not get it if I don't receive the answer. How do I receive the answer? By what I say. By what I say. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for my new car. I thank you. It's on its way. I believe I have received my new car, and I want to praise and glorify you. Because it says in Proverbs 18, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, those who love life, will eat the fruit of life. Because they say what the word says. They receive by saying, thank you, it's mine now, I have it now. 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love death will eat its fruit by saying, gosh, God, you didn't answer me. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you answer me? Some people talk like that to God. I've heard them. Well, you'll never get what you pray for until you receive it by saying, thank you, it's mine, I have it now. Lombano, the hand of faith reaches out and takes it. And you know, some of these things we ask for are outlandish. We've got a Barnabas in this church who's outlandish asker. Great man of God. Because he knows God can do it and is doing it and he receives. Go to Romans 4. Here's the answer. The minute we ask, we need to receive, and then we practice Mark eleven twenty three. We say the right thing. Thank you, Father, it's mine. You have integrity. I asked, it's within my covenant rights that you will meet all my needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Therefore, it's mine now. I have it now. I'm not looking to my senses to see it. I'm not looking to my senses to see it. Second Corinthians 4.18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, if you're going to ask God something and then look at what's seen, you're on the wrong road. Second Corinthians 4.18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We look at the word of God, that's seen, but we look at God's character. We look at our faith, which says, it's mine, I have it now. So we look at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So when we ask, then there's a protocol to follow. You ask, right then you receive. What's next? You start praising God for your answer. You stay in praise and worship for your answer. Romans 4.17, as it is written, talking about Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to dead things and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. When are you going to call it? When are you going to call it? When are you going to say, I have it now, I praise you, I thank you, I receive it. I take it now. It's mine. I'm not letting go of it. So to keep from not letting go of it, you have to stay in praise and worship for it. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, there was no way that Abraham and Sarah could have progeny, have a baby. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed. There, they had to ask bigger than we have had to ask. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now here's the point, verse 19. Romans 4, 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. You can't consider your body or your situation or who you are. You have to consider who God is. Although already dead since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. This is how you receive. You say, it's mine, I have it now. You have integrity. You promise to meet my needs. I'm receiving it now. And now I'm going to praise and worship you until I see the answer with my five physical sen senses. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened by faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. This is how we receive. We have to go beyond where we are right now. 
That means stop considering yourself. Don't consider who you are. Don't consider what you have. Don't consider your lack, or I'm this, or I'm that. Don't beat yourself up with the what ifs and if onlys. Drop all that. Only consider God and his faithfulness.